Praise the Lord. I want you to turn your Bible to John chapter 4. We bring, draw to a conclusion this series. Sometimes you have to walk away from the well. Last Sunday, as, as this church took to the parking lot and to the streets, some marching down to West Belfort, some marching down to South Brazewood, as we took to the streets, brothers and sisters, we walked away from the well. Because sometimes you've got to walk away from the well. We live in a world that is desperate for Jesus today. Now, whether or not they know it's Jesus that they're desperate for, we know that's, that's who they need. The Pew Institute, two years ago, May of 2015, draw, drew this research. And I quote, The Christian share of the U.S. population is declining. While the number of U.S. adults who do not identify with any organized religion is growing. While the drop in Christian affiliation is particularly pronounced among young adults, it is occurring among Christians of, excuse me, Americans of all ages. The same trends are seen among whites, blacks, and Latinos, among both college graduates and adults with only a high school education, and among women as well as men. This nation is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. As the years progress, and if the Lord tarries as the decades progress, unless something changes, not in the nation, but unless something changes in the church in America, that trend is going to continue and continue and continue. Where more and more, per capita, the Christian church in America will shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And I know there's some thinking, well, you know, there are mega churches. But the question arises, where, where do the people come from that attend those mega churches? There are churches on every street corner in the city of Houston. You can't throw a rock without hitting a church someplace. So why, there are so many churches, why is the percentage of believers shrinking, declining? While those that are confessed agnostics and atheists, that group is growing. Well, I believe it testifies to this specific issue that the church had better come to grips with, and that is this. Unless we become the church of Jesus Christ, this nation is in big trouble. You see, the answer is not outside the church, friends. The answer is inside the church. And I'm not talking about organized religion. I'm not talking about denominationalism. I'm talking about Jesus is the answer of this nation's woes. There is no other answer. You can run to the Democrats. They don't have the answer. I'm not over yet. <laughs> you can run to the Republicans. They don't have the answer. Because Jesus is the answer. And brothers and sisters, if we don't believe that, and if we don't embrace that, we are in a heap of trouble. This nation is in big, big trouble. The mandate of Jesus on this earth was not to coronate a denomination. He didn't come to establish a denomination. He did not come to us to establish a, a hub of commerce where the church can be a place where we buy books and we see movies and, and, and we go to Christian events. That's not why Jesus came. There's nothing wrong with those things. He didn't come to launch a social club. That the church would be a place where people would gather together and bless your brother, bless your sister, oh hallelujah, praise God. That's a part. But the mandate of Jesus, commissioned by God himself, sending Jesus to accomplish, is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 19. It's found in a story of Zacchaeus, a little man, a little messed up man. He, he was a tax collector from Rome. He was a thief, despised by everyone who knew what he did. And Jesus was passing by. Jesus was just coming into town. And Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus never dreamed he would have an encounter with God. Never, or Jesus never dreamed that Jesus would have anything to do with him. He just wanted to see a good parade. And so he got it the best vantage point. He climbed up to a tree in a tree. He didn't climb up that tree to have Jesus talk to him. He didn't climb up to that tree to have an encounter. He climbed up the tree just to see the parade pass by. But Jesus... When he was passing by, stop, because there was a divine appointment between Zacchaeus and Jesus. 
appointed by God himself. And as Jesus passed by, he looked up and he saw this little guy up in a tree. And in essence, he said, I'll paraphrase, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house for lunch today. Zacchaeus, you just invited me over to your house for lunch. Zacchaeus, the Bible doesn't tell us that he threw up his hands and said, no, 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 you can't. I don't want you. I'm not good. And he didn't say anything. The Bible just implies that Zacchaeus said, okay, let's go. And they went to Zacchaeus' house. And while he was there, Zacchaeus had an encounter with God. He didn't intend that encounter, but God intended that encounter. And he's had such an encounter, such a radical transformation in his life that this IRS agent said, if I have stolen anything, I'll give it back with interest. Listen, when the IRS gives you back money with interest, that is a radical transformation. Anything I've stolen, I'll give it back with interest. Brother and sister, that's an encounter with God. That's the consequence of an encounter with Jesus. When they were questioning Christ, why would you go to a sinner's home? Why would you associate with sinners? This is what Jesus said, Luke chapter 19, verse 19. The Son of Man came to find lost people and save them. Can you get any, can you get any more simple than that? Why is it we want to make complicated everything? Why was it that we want to take something, a simple premise of find lost people and lead them to Jesus, and we want to complicate it with all kinds of things? when all Jesus did was come to seek and save the lost. And let me tell you this morning, that's our mandate as well. That's not just Brazewood's mandate. That's the mandate of the church in America. That's the mandate of the church worldwide. Not just to have church, not just to have service, not just to read the word, not just to sing. All of those things are important. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the end of it. We should come to the well to drink, to be refreshed, to rejoice, and to celebrate and encourage one another. But sometimes you've got to walk away from the well. Pauline Phillips, some of you will remember her as Dear Abby, said the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. You know, there are, there are some churches that sinners aren't even welcome. If, if you're a sinner, if you're lost, if you've lost your way in, in life or in the world, whether you're a prodigal or just never known the Lord, and you come into church, they make you feel like you're, like you're out of place, almost like you shouldn't be here. Get saved and then come to church. That's kind of the attitude that some churches have. And I say to that, <laughs> you want to delete that from the, from the video that goes out, please. That's a, that, that, that's a, that's a theological term. <laughs> That's what I say. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. We are here in this place. We are at the well. And isn't it refreshing today? Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go home. Come on. Isn't it refreshing to be in the presence of the Lord today? But sometimes you've got to leave the well. You drink. You're refreshed. He is glorified. We are changed and transformed but we don't live here. We don't live here. And I'll, even furthermore, the lost aren't here primarily. Those that don't know, if the mandate of Jesus was to find lost people and save them, most of the lost people are not in the well or at the well. Most of them are out there. Sometimes you've got to leave the well. The mandate of Jesus, commissioned by God himself, is our mandate. We are not here to build a church. God spoke that into my life several years ago, maybe a over a decade ago. God hasn't called us to build a church. God has called us to build the kingdom of God. Amen. Not enough. God has not called us to build a church. God has called us to build the kingdom of God. Amen. You're getting there. God has not called us to build a church. God has called us to build the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. That's what, if, if that was the mandate of Jesus, what makes us think that we have separated ourselves from that mandate? That is our mandate. To find lost people, and where do you find them? You find them away from the well. You've got to walk away. Find the Lord. Find that, that imperative of, of connection with God, that, that encounter with God, and be refreshed, be strengthened, but not just for yourself. Thank God for what he's done for me today. But in just a few minutes, I'm going to leave the well. You see, this is our mandate. 
This is the church's mandate. When I get to heaven, as a pastor, when I get to heaven, God is not going to ask me how big was the church you pastored. Not going to ask me that question. He's not going to say, well, all of you that, that pastor a church of over 2,000, you come over here, and those of you under 200, you go over here. God's not going to do that. God's not impressed with our numbers. He created the universe. You think he's going to be impressed with my little works? But what he will ask me, were you faithful? Were you faithful with what I gave you? I think we could paraphrase to say, are you faithful when you leave the well? Are you faithful when you walk away? Because sometimes you've got to walk away from the well. Our text today, it's important to note that Jesus was not in the synagogue. That Jesus was not in the company of believers. In fact, it's important to note that the disciples left Jesus. He sent them off. Do you know what would have happened if the disciples had remained with Jesus? They would have pushed this Samaritan woman away. They would have pushed her away, number one, because she was a Samaritan and Jews hated Samaritans. And, and Samaritans, likewise, hated Jews. They would have pushed her away because she was a woman. And in that season, in that day of time, men and women didn't converse like this. So, so Jesus, knowing that this was an eternal moment, he, he told the disciples, go, go and buy food. Just go. I'm going to sit here by the well. Go buy food. I can almost hear Peter say, I'll just sit here with you, Jesus. No, Peter, you go. Of everybody, you better go. And Jesus sits down by the well. That, that was his mandate. That was his divine appointment. He wasn't surrounded by believers. I think sometimes we go out away from the well, and, and we're, we're kind, of, kind of nervous a little bit, I suppose. But, you know, what do I do? What do I say? Can we just keep it simple? Just, just a T-shirt. A T-shirt. A lady had two encounters with people to tell them how good Jesus was. My church, I love my church. Why do you love my church? Because Jesus is in my church. You mean Jesus? Not Jesus. Jesus is in my church. The Spirit of the Lord is here. God touches people's lives. Just a t-shirt. Why is it we want to make everything complicated? Why is it that we want to go into training and learn all the scriptures? Well, that is good. I'm not, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. It's good that we know the word, that we can speak the word of God to people. We, we want to know all the answers before we go. You're never going to know all the answers. You're never going to be able to, to initiate or, or rehearse all of the answers that somebody might ask about God. You're never going to know that. We want to wait until we're mature. Well, here's the problem. A lot of times we get mature and then we don't go out of the well. Let's make it simple. Let's just keep the gospel simple as we keep our mandate simple. Jesus said you were the light of the world. He didn't say you're becoming. He didn't say it would happen one day. He didn't say read and study and then become the light of the world. He said to a bunch of knucklehead disciples, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. And let me tell you, if you're born again today, you are the light of the world. You don't have to go to class to learn how to be the light of the world. Jesus in you is the light of the world. Let his light shine and radiate from your life. You are not commissioned by the church to be the light. You are not commissioned by a religion to be the light. You are not commissioned by a charismatic personality to be the light. You have been commissioned by God to be the light of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but that charges my batteries. It wasn't just a church commissioning me. It wasn't a personality to me saying go. It was God himself that says, I send you as the light of the world. We are commissioned. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill that mission. And we shall fulfill that mission by the grace of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. Our text this morning, John chapter 4, verse 28 through 30. And then verse 39 through 43, Father, as we read your word, the most important words spoken are these right now, because these are your words. And Father, let them be simple words spoken into our spirit with revelation by the Holy Spirit for application into my life, because sometimes you call us to leave the well. I pray, Heavenly Father, that each word will penetrate our heart this morning and that as we stand here this morning, as we are here in this sanctuary this morning, through this message, we will have an encounter with God that will change my life. And we honor you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town. Now, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. This is not step in chronological order. But we see that she left her water jar. What she came to get, she left and said to the people, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And so they came out of town and made their way towards him. In verse 39, many of the Samaritans believed from that, many of the Samaritans from that town believed because of the woman's testimony. Now here's a woman just had an encounter with God. She didn't know hardly anything. She didn't know much about Jesus. She knew about the Messiah. She made that a part of the conversation. But as she left, she didn't tell them theological arguments. She didn't tell them answering all their questions. But many of them believed just because of her testimony. Can we keep it simple? He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed with them for two days. And because, verse 41, and because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I want to draw several thoughts here quickly about, about this encounter that this woman had. It was, a, it was an encounter that was not only meant for her, but was meant for that entire city, a Samaritan city, a city that most Jews would just have walked around, and if they went through it, they'd go through it as fast as they can, as quick as they can, not stopping to talk to anybody, not stopping to purchase anything, just get through it as fast as you can. But when Jesus came to that Samaritan town, he sat down by the well, and he told the disciples to leave him so that he was by the well himself. Sometimes you have to walk away from the well. First of all, we learned that the Samaritan woman had an encounter with God. She had an encounter with Jesus. That's why he was there. You see, verse 29 says, Come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. She had an encounter that transformed her life. But for her to have that encounter, Jesus had to leave the well. I'm not talking about this well. I'm talking about the place of being with the disciples. I'm talking about the, 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 the Mount of Olives where he would fellowship with God. I'm talking about that place where he was nourished. I'm talking about that place where he was refreshed. He had to leave that place. And traveling through Samaria, remember the Bible says he must go through Samaria. He sat down by this well. Jesus had to leave his well to touch the woman at her well. And he sat down at the well, and the well here is, is described as a place of meeting. He went, this is important, he went where she was. He didn't demand that she come to him. He didn't demand that she come to a service. She didn't, he didn't demand that she come to a Bible study. He went to where she was. In her maximum impact environment in that place that she had the greatest potential to make the greatest impact for the kingdom of God. Jesus went to her. Why is it that we always expect people to come to us? We expect people to come to the church, and thank God they do. You're evidenced by that this morning. Thank God for that. But why is it that's the only thing we expect? The Bible says Jesus' commission was to find lost people and save them. Well, where do you find lost people? Typically, you don't find them in the synagogues. Typically, you don't find them in the churches. Typically, you don't find them in Christian organizations. Typically, you find them at the well, at the places they are, the common gathering places. His intent was not to impress her. His intent was not to entertain her. His intent was not to offend her, though the words that he spoke sounded like they would have been offensive. Go get your husband. Well... The man I'm living with is not my husband. Uh, you said right, Jesus said, because you had five husbands, and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. Well, doesn't that sound offensive? Why bring that up? Why, why talk about that? He spoke about that because that was the hurt of her heart. That was the pain and the anguish. That was the humiliation of her heart. That was the brokenness of her life. And Jesus spoke to that. In essence, he said, you're broken. Well, you know what? You don't have to tell broke people they're broken. They know they're broken. They know they're hurting. His intention for that meeting was to have an encounter with that woman. 
In our maximum impact environment, our intention is not to offend people. Our intention is simply to tell people about Jesus. Just show him the light of Christ in our life. Secondly, after the encounter, she walked away from the well. And she didn't walk away from the well because she felt guilty. A lot of times, that's our motivation. We feel guilty. Oh, man, I, I gotta, God wants me to share my faith with somebody, so i got to find... You know, with an attitude like that, who wants what you got? i got to find somebody to share Jesus with. Do you know Jesus? Oh, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> she walked away from the well, not out of guilt or condemnation. She walked away from the well because she had discovered something. Something that changed her life. Something that made her life a life worth living. She had drank. Jesus said, you know, if you only knew, you could have this spring of living water. Let me know what that, where is that spring of living water so that I don't have to draw? She was taking literally, but he was speaking into her spirit. And so when she did, she had that encounter with Jesus and she was able to drink from that water and it refreshed her spirit in her life. What did she do? She wanted to go to find more thirsty people. Who's thirsty? Who do I know that's thirsty? Come and come to the well. Come to the place where I found what was satisfying to my spirit. Come to the place where I was healed. Come to the place where I was delivered. Come to the place where I was changed. Jim Cimbala said, people pay attention when they see what God has actually done in changing a person's life. And he sets them free. When a new Christian stands up and tells how God has revolutionized his or her life, no one dozes off. When we tell people what Jesus is, you know, we can argue theology. We can argue doctrine. We can argue church leaders. We can argue about churches, denominations. But nobody can argue with you what God has done in your life. Nobody can argue what Jesus means to you. They can't argue that point. And when we're willing to share with them those that are thirsty, when we tell them, I have found the well that will satisfy your spirit, why don't you come with me? Not to Brazewood, to Jesus. He's the one that will satisfy your heart and your life. Remember this, every sinner has a past. Excuse me. Every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. That's God's plan. Every saint, everyone in this room, you have a past. Some of us, we, we don't even want to remember our past. We don't want to even think upon our past. But remember this, every sinner has a future. Every sinner has a right to know Jesus Christ, has the right to know that Jesus is the answer. The greatest need for light is in the place of the greatest darkness. And do you know where the greatest darkness is? In your maximum impact environment. Thirdly, after she walked away from the well, what did she do next? She led people back to the well. The Bible says they came. The whole city turned out. And they came as, as I suspect she, where, where is he? Where, he's at the well. Come follow me. Let me take you to Jesus. Let me take you to the one that told me everything that I ever did. And that wasn't a great thing. She led them back to Jesus. She led them back to the well. The thirsty made their way. Those who have lost their way will always find refreshing in Jesus. Sometimes you've got to walk away from the well. I was one of our members here, Matthew and Yuri. Is Matthew here this morning? He was here earlier. Matthew? He had to step out for a minute. Matthew is the bookkeeper here at the church. And Thursday morning I got a text from Matthew and he told me, he said, Pastor, my mother just passed away. And so... I told Matthew, text, we'll be praying for you. We'll be praying for you. And when I got to the office, Matthew came in and we talked a little bit. I asked him, I said, Matthew, was your mother born again? He said, oh, yes, yes. And then he told me a story. When Matthew was young, in the 70s, his father passed away. His mother and father were not born again. They did not serve the Lord, didn't love, love God, it had nothing to do with the Lord whatsoever. And when Matthew's father passed away, Matthew's mother sent Matthew to his brother, his older brother's house. Now, coming from an environment where God was not honored, the older brother, after he had left and gone on his own, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Born again, radically born again. Assembly of God, baptized in the Holy Spirit, loved Jesus, totally committed to God. So Matthew left that environment to go into this new environment. And in that environment, because he was at the well and his brother was sharing with him, 
Matthew tasted of that living water and his life was transformed. Matthew accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and was radically saved. And then came time for Matthew to leave the well, the well where it was safe with his brother, an environment that loved and honored and served God, but it was time for Matthew to leave the well. And he went back home to his mother's house. And Matthew said that his mother was watching him. And he said his mother would make him a sandwich and he would, he would pray over that sandwich before he would eat it. And his mother said, Matthew, stop this nonsense. When, when are you going to get over this? Matthew just kept right on living, serving the Lord. Every meal he'd pray and, and, and go to church. He, he, he was radically, he had a radical encounter with God. His mother said to him later, I was just watching to see how long this thing was going to take to stop. But it didn't stop. And Matthew kept being the light in front of his mother. And his mother accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she was radically transformed, saved. So radically saved from not knowing the Lord to coming into not only being saved but baptized in the Holy Spirit that, that people would come and, and give her a little bit of money to buy food with and she'd take 10% right off the top and give it to the Lord. That's radical salvation. And today... Matthew's mother is with Jesus. Why? Because Matthew left the well. He left the well of his brother's safe home. He left the well of the security of being in a Christian environment. He left the well to go back to his home, to his mother, who didn't know Jesus because God knew his mother needed Jesus. Sometimes you've got to leave the well. Let me leave you, real quickly, let me leave you three principles here that we've got to glean within our own heart and life. Number one, the Samaritan woman had an encounter with Jesus. If you don't hear another thing I say, if, if I am gone tomorrow, hear this and take it to heart. Make it your priority every single day to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Every day. Not Sunday only. Not Wednesday only. Not Thursday at West Campus only. Every single day you can have an encounter with God. Why is it that we've relegated an encounter with God to Sunday? Why is it that we've accepted in our mind that the only time God can really move in my life is when I'm in church? Nonsense. Why is it we make things so complicated? God is not a God of this building. God is a God of this tabernacle. This is where he dwells. This is where his spirit dwells. Which means when I go to work this afternoon, God is with me. And God can speak into my life. I can drive my car. God can speak into my life. I can be laying in my bed and God can speak into my life. I can be working with my hands, laboring hard, and God can speak into my life. Make it your priority every single day. I am going to have an encounter with Jesus today. I'm going to say it again. Make it your priority, the highest point in your life. When you write out the list of things you're doing, put the top. Encounter with Jesus today. When you're listing out your objectives for the day, encounter with Jesus right at the top. Make it your priority to have an encounter with Jesus every single day. Make it your priority. Listen, I, I, I'm, as, I'm as honest as I can be. If you don't get anything else today, get this. Get this. Make it your priority. Every day, top of your list, I am going to have an encounter with God today. Not good enough. I want you to get it in your heart. Every day is a day of an encounter with God. Now you got it. And I pray it's not just a loud amen, but it's in our spirit. Every day, if you're retired, encounter with God. If you're in school, encounter with God. If you're on your job, an encounter with God. If you're laying in your bed, an encounter with God. Make it your priority. That's what she did. She had, first and foremost, she had an encounter with Jesus. And everything else resulted from that. You can't give away what you don't have. You can't give Jesus to people who do not have Jesus in their heart. Well, you can give the church, you can give religion, you can give denomination, you can give a whole lot of stuff, but the only way to give Jesus is to have him in your heart and to have an encounter with God every single day. 
On Monday, you're going to have an encounter with God. On Tuesday, you're going to have an encounter with God. On Wednesday, you're going to have an encounter with God. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then we'll come together. You know what we're going to do? We're going to celebrate the encounters with God we've had all week long. And after we celebrate, we're going to have another encounter with God. That's, the prior, that's what she did. If she had not had an encounter with God, she would have accomplished nothing by leaving the well. I'll tell you what she'd accomplish. She'd have a jug of water. That's what she would accomplish. But she left the well because she had an encounter with Jesus. Number two, and importantly, after the encounter, she walked away from the well. Brother and sister, in just about five minutes, you're going to walk away from the well. If this is the well where we draw and we're refreshed, if this is the well where we have today had an encounter with God, if this is the well that we're encouraged by brothers and sisters and we study the Word of God and we worship, if this is the well, in just a few minutes, you're going to walk away from the well. And when you walk away from the well, you represent the kingdom of God. Seek and save those that are lost. And don't do it out of guilt. Guilt will not motivate you maybe that long. That's it. Guilt is not a good motivator. Encounter is a good motivator. An encounter with God that transforms your life. A joy that fills your soul. Power of the Spirit that indwells your life. That is a motivation. She didn't feel guilty. In fact, I believe, if anything, her guilt was relieved. Don't feel guilt. Don't, feel, don't let the enemy put guilt and condemnation in your heart and life. God doesn't. If God doesn't put guilt on you, why would you allow the enemy to do the same? Rebuke the guilt and be the light that is naturally within your heart and life. There are thirsty people all around you. They will never find the well if you don't tell them where the well is. Number three, after she walked away from the well, she led the lost right back to the well. That's the key. It's not just leaving the well. We're going to do that anyway. It's not just leaving the well. It's not just walking away from the well. It's leading people back to the well. And by well, in this case, I don't mean Brazewood. I mean Jesus. She led people back to Jesus. She, she led people. And you've got to think, the disciples were absolutely amazed. In fact, they were amazed that he was even talking to her when they came back. They wanted to give him food. I don't need food. Don't you know, when you've had that encounter with God and you bring somebody to Jesus, don't you know you are satisfied in your spirit? I mean, that, that's a satisfaction that nothing else can provide for you. But to know you have, you have done what God has called you to do. You've been the light. Pray. Trust God. Remain faithful. Someone once said, we draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe or by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all of their heart to know the source of it. Keep it simple. Walking across the street with a casserole to give to a family when a member of the family is sick. And not just to do a good work, but to connect, connect the well to the work. I just want you to know Jesus loves you. I, I give this to you because I love Christ and he's done so much in my life and I just want you to know that. Please take this casserole. Simple. Or, or, or a family, a mother, a single mother who's got to go do errands and got children and, and it hinders her from doing it and somebody willing to say, you know, I'll take care of your kids for a couple hours. No problem. And, and you know why I'm doing I'm doing this because Jesus has blessed me so much. He's done so much in my life. He's provided, and I, I just want to do this for you. Would you let me take care of your children? Keep it simple. Or, or at work, when somebody says, my, I'm worried about my daughter. She's, she's sick today, and I almost had to take off work because, to take care of her, but I'm really worried about her. Hey, can I pray with you right now? Can, can, can I just pray that God will heal your daughter? And then just a simple prayer. Heavenly Father, my friend's daughter is sick, but you already know that. Would you heal her? The Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus Christ we are healed. Touch this child and heal her in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep it simple. Some people want to preach a whole sermon. Oh God, you know in Genesis the Bible says. And then Lord in Exodus and then... And then, Father, we've gone through the whole Bible in Revelations. It says, no, you don't have to do that. Keep it simple. And, and let me tell you this. When you pray, when you give, when you go, 
walking away from the well to tell people about Jesus. When God answers their prayer, when God touches their life, they will know it's Heavenly Father. Because you've walked away from the well. Bow your heads with me, please. Father, what a blessing it is today to know that Jesus went to the well. He left his well to go to her well. He left the comfort of the surroundings. He left the comfort of the disciples that were speaking good to him. He left the comfort of Mount of Olives where he prayed and sought you. He left all of that to to come to the well. And Father, even beyond that, he left heaven to come to our well. Had an encounter with her. Father, may it be for us that desire, that high priority, that most high priority. Today I have an encounter with God. She left the well. And Father, in just a moment, we're going to leave the well. And as we go, Father, there are more people who don't know Jesus away from this well than there are who are here. Though there may be somebody here this morning that a prodigal who's coming back, somebody who has never served the Lord. And in this moment, in hearing this story, they've realized that, you know, if God loved that Samaritan woman, he could love me too. If God could accept that Samaritan woman, he could accept me too, and he will. Father, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you will help us to keep things simple. Not to complicate it, because the more we complicate it, the more we have to rely upon ourselves to do something. The more we complicate it, the more we excuse ourselves because we can't do it. But to just keep it simple. To walk away from the well to tell people what Jesus has done for me. Father, be glorified today. And I pray that you bring people into the kingdom. That's our mandate. Our mandate's not to build a church. Father, it'd be great if, if, if and as the church grows. That's wonderful, but... That's not what we're about. We're about finding the lost and bringing them to Jesus. So empower us by your Holy Spirit. Empower us that we might be the light that we are already called to be, the salt that you have said that we are. And we give you honor and praise, Father, that this is a change of our heart and spirit in the very core of this church from today until Jesus comes back. In Jesus' name. And everybody said...